game is to be where you are, be it honestly and as consciously as you know how. Watch the latest Ram Dass documentary film, Becoming Nobody, on Gaia.com. Of course, there was fear in losing that familiar identity. But there was always also wonder. The Gaia.com library supports you with transformational content. See it for yourself and go to Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and check out the Be Here Now playlist curated just for you. Visit Gaia.com slash Be Here Now and start your free trial today. Hi, and welcome to Ramdas Here and Now. I'm Raghu Marcus. We have a great uh, talk from Ramdas from 1987, October actually, called The Path of Awakening, and I'm going to get into it in a minute, introduce it. Uh, meanwhile, I have a couple of announcements. One of them is about our new partner, Gaia TV. And uh, they are streaming as we speak and have been the last couple of months, Becoming Nobody. And uh, they're a uh, wonderful platform for consciousness and spirituality content and really transformational content. Uh, I would suggest that you all check it out at Gaia.com, G-A-I-A dot com slash Be Here Now. And uh, there's a lot more there, obviously, than, uh, than just the uh, Becoming Nobody with Ram Dass. They also, they also have a couple of other uh, um, pieces of media from Ram Dass that are great. And I'm looking, we are looking to do much more with them uh, to provide content for their platform. And uh, again, check it out, Gaia.com slash Be Here Now. And also, I want to let everybody know about a, just a fantastic new book from a woman named Valerie Carr, a Sikh uh, woman who, Sikh, but they pronounce it Sikh. So that was something I learned when I just talked to her, because I did a podcast with her on Mind Rolling, which will be out uh, in the next few days uh, after this particular podcast with Ram Dass. And um, basically, well, first of all, it's called See No Stranger, a memoir and manifesto of revolutionary love. And Valerie has been involved in social justice for a very long time, both as a lawyer, as a documentary, uh, documentary uh, filmmaker, and uh, activist. And, but this book has got so many different levels uh, it's got real inner social action as well as outer social action, which is core to what Ramdas has been all about all of the decades that uh, he was uh, teaching uh, in the West. And I can't more highly recommend this book. It's it's just out, and uh, uh, you you be able to hear her on the Mind Rolling podcast as I said, and there'll be uh, links and so on. I, there'll be a link here on Ram Dass, uh, on, on the show notes for this particular episode. So uh, that's it for our announcements, and on to the path of awakening. So uh, basically, the premise here is we have all, all of us that are on the path, touch states of transcendence, right? How? could be you know, obviously one of the major ways for us back in the day was through psychedelics. But it, it was, for me, my initial um, transcendence was through a piece of, of music, of sitting um, in, in a club. I don't know how I got in there at 15 years old with John Coltrane um, and just went out. Um, my favorite things. He played that song and that was it for me. So, uh, you know, it can be a book, it can be a teacher, it can be a, 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 a dream. There are so many ways that we all touch that state. And once you realize that, as Ramda says, there are no other, there are, uh, once you realize that there are other realities other than, than the one that you are familiar with, everything changes, right? Everything changes. You're on a path to freedom at that point. Um, 
And of course, you know, one of the pitfalls is that um, it gets to the point where sometimes you just kind of want to go back and get lost in that drama and the, the excitement of the hip- habitual patterns because we're used to them and they kind of feel comfy. But ultimately, the old style of taking your ego so seriously in, in all of those circumstances from habitual patterns to neurotic tendencies, it just falls away. It's an amazing thing. Absolutely amazing thing, you know. And uh, so uh, what else? Uh, oh, here's something that really uh, Ramdas pointed to that uh, really is uh, relational with what's going on today. He said, so, you know, there's no way you, you can't not do anything, right? Because you come to think, okay, I'm thinking of this pandemic and everything else that's going on now, I just want to get in bed and put a pillow over my face. But that's still an action, right? So there is no not doing anything. And the question is, what's, what's the form? And that's what he talks about in this talk. What form is that going to take, you know? And I think, as he says, once incarnation, it's a vehicle. Everything that happens to us in this life is a vehicle for liberation. And that's what our business here is, right? Grist for the mill, he called it in in one of his books. And I would add that that liberation includes all humans, all humans to be liberated, which is the bodhisattva vow from Buddhism. I'm not going anywhere until everyone is free. And this, this vast interconnectedness that we are feeling these days through not just the pandemic, but uh, the economic deprivation of, of brothers and sisters and uh, the obvious racial injustice that's going on right now and the, and the protests against them and the wake-up call that that's serving, uh, this, this is so self-evident. That liberation includes all humans. And, um, you know, we just all got to quiet down. And uh, only through quieting down, which is through practice, meditation, other practices, whatever they are, uh, then we start to act in alignment with our dharma, as Ram Dass puts it, the way of things. So you, you take whatever is on the plate in order and process it in order to become free. Um, what else? Oh, there's some great aphorisms here from him. Uh, He's so good at that stuff, isn't he? It's incredible. No one who has not sacrificed their suffering, right, can do this work, which is just to give huge amounts of space and embrace around what we encounter on a day-to-day basis. That's what sacrifice is, in my mind. Um, which is, uh, you know, st- you don't milk and identify with it, is, is what he says in the talk as well. All in very important things. And, um, and one of the most crucial things that I heard in this talk is from him, uh, uh, which really relates to the path of awakening, of being woke, as they say. The more you're rooted in emptiness, the more your human heart is available. And to me, you know, emptiness is a big word. It's, it's a primary uh, term in Buddhism. And uh, I, I always like to uh, repeat what uh, Bob Thurman has said as a definition for emptiness, which is emptiness is the womb of bliss. Right? So it's a, it's a very big thing. It's a very big thing. But as a more relative thing, talking about it in, in this particular um, quote from Ram Dass, you know, it, it's for me the letting go of the self-interest, 
I find that is the biggest impediment to opening up, opening up to, to be able to embrace suffering, opening, opening up to be able to, to have an undefended heart. Right? So once you start to let go, and, and you see it, if you just start to think, you know, in, in, in the situations arise where suddenly somebody is in need around you, and, and mostly we have a knee-jerk reaction to go help that person or that situation. And as soon as we do that, we're letting go of our, uh, um, the thinking about ourselves that we do all day long. We let go of that in the moment that we are uh, ready to help somebody else. So once that, and of course, that has to be nurtured again through practice. And once that happens, then that heart becomes way more available and way more undefended. So I love that. So, yep, Path of Awakening. Another great talk from Ram Dass. I mean, there's... uh, I don't know uh, if any of you out there, we have been putting out a wonderful thing that comes from our development director, Rachel Fisher, at ramdas.org. Every week, uh, she's been uh, assembling different um, talks, blogs, videos, you know, not just from Ramdas, but from our Be Here Now network as well. And it's called Resources for Resilience. If you haven't seen it, uh, or if because you haven't noticed and the Ram, stuff coming from Ram Dass Love Server members going into spam bucket, get in there and change that out or, or do go to ramdas.org and put your email address in because there's some really helpful stuff that, that is being uh, shared. So um, highly recommend that. And uh, we're going to see you next time on Ramdas Here and Now on Be Here Now Network. Oh, yeah, Be Here Now Network's got a couple of new um, podcasters coming along. One is Nikki Walton. Check her out. Wonderful, wonderful young woman uh, who uh, just started out with us. Um, and uh, coming soon is Conda Mason. And I want to tell you about that uh, uh, in another pod, I did a podcast with her. I've done one. I'm, I actually just did another one, and she's also somebody who's steeped in um, uh, social justice and racial injustice, and uh, is so eloquent and incredible. And of course, Robert Svoboda, our friend, uh, he's uh, got a wonderful podcast that uh, we started a couple of a few weeks ago. So yeah, be here now. Network dot com. Check it out, and we'll see you next time. Namaste. This is a quote from Dante. I have been in that heaven, the most illumined by light from him, and seen things which to utter, one who returns hath neither skill nor knowledge. For as it nears the object of its yearning, our intellect is overwhelmed so deeply, it can never retrace the path that it followed. But whatsoever of the holy kingdom was in the power of memory to treasure will be my theme until the song is ended. Many of us have touched states of transcendence. In fact, all of us do. But most of us, as I said before, have structures that lead to denying them. And once we've touched them, our lives are different. Once we acknowledge we have touched them and not reject them out of hand. We are all literally going out of our minds a lot. And yet we later treat those experiences unless they are extremely profound. Like I was talking with Rusty Schweikert, who was one of the astronauts. And he described how as he hung on to the outside of the spacecraft and there was time when they, the camera had broken and they just had free time to sit there, to stand there. And there was a moment when he saw the earth and he was in the universe and something happened at that moment. And it's so powerful. His whole life's been different since then. He, 
It's one of the problems they have with the astronaut program. <laughs> and people that have had near-death experiences, many of them have met things which were so inconsistent with their models of reality that they did, as Rilke said, they just kind of crowded them out of the space. They didn't have space for them. Once you have recognized that there are other realities other than the one that you have been familiar with, your life starts to change. I don't care whether you got it from a joint, whether you got it from meditation, whether you got it from sex, whether you got it from trauma, whether you got it from uh, surfing or whatever. Whatever thing you did that took you beyond yourself, you could have taught it from religious ecstasy in temple or church. You could have gotten it in a thousand different ways. Whatever it was, if you acknowledged it as, as real as what you started from, you are on the way. That is what's known as awakening. From the moment you have awakened, that is, you acknowledge the fact that you are more than you think you are and that the universe is different than your conceptual structure has it to be. From then on, the rest of your life is all the grist for the mill of awakening. It's all that process that the awakened awareness uses the stuff from then on in order to get free. It's all the journey to freedom from then on. And you literally cannot fall off the path. You can think you fell off the path, which many people do. They say, oh, I lost it. I blew it. I used to be so high. Whatever spiritual gains you make from moment to moment are yours if they are real gains. If you just have them like uh, something you're holding on to, you can lose them. But the basic journey is a journey of the awakening. You don't, the thing is, you can't go back to sleep once you start to awaken. You can appear. You know how you try to go back to sleep because you went, woke up before the alarm clock? <clears throat> and you lie there and you try to go back to sleep. I mean, it's even more horrible than that. Because when you were asleep, you could milk your melodramas for all they were worth. You could trip out on stuff. Will it? Won't it? Can I? Can I? Should I? Shouldn't I? Did he? Didn't he? Uh, and afterwards, you just see yourself doing it. There he goes, milking the drama again. And you want to milk it some more. That's the problem. I mean, this is shorthand conversation. Some of you will understand it. You really want to milk it. You really want to get lost back into the drama. You want to be back in the romanticism of life. Because the predicament is that something dies in you when something new is born. And what dies in you is a certain old style of taking your ego so seriously. You just can't quite get into it, quite with the same verve you used to be able to, you know. So what we are about is a process of transformation then that happens, and it is a road that is just like this. It's highs and lows and depressions and elations and now you got it and now you lost it and you grab something and then it just turns into more spiritual materialism and it turns into nothing. And you just watch this process and you see that in the late 60s, a lot of people in early 70s, a lot of people got what I call phony holy. They intellectually saw where they wanted to be and then they imitated it as if they were that. It's like imitating the Buddha or imitating the Christ or imitating Mother Teresa or whatever or Ananda Mai Ma. And the fraudulence of that, because we in the West are used to our intellect, leading with our intellect. So we see where we want to be and we imitate it and then pull ourselves into it. <clears throat> the fraudulence of that leads to a reaction. <clears throat> and you found the same people who you saw first in white with big smiles and doing beads and very holy. See them a few years later at the local bar. Now, 
saying, oh, that was all crap. Uh, it was all, you know, I was off my mind. That was a cult. I'm done with that stuff. And now we got to deal with the real things of the world. And they say, I, I gave it up. But all they're doing is going through another part of the process. See, there's no way out of it once you start. That's the problem. I often feel like saying people don't start. <laughs> See, I mean, it's too late for you already. I'm sorry, because... The, you're here and you already, you, you already know too much. The, <clears throat> a great story of a little boy that's being chased in Central Park and I read it in the New Yorker and uh, this other kid says to him, is chasing him and the other kid's big and the little kid starts to climb up a tree. Big guy's climbing up and the little kid says, I'm making you climb this tree big guy says, no, you're not. And he keeps climbing. He says, I'm making you climb the tree. No, you're not. I'm not going to climb the tree. So the big guy gets down, starts to walk away. And the kid says, I'm making you walk away. He yells from the tree. Big guy says, no, you're not. And as the big boy walks out of the park, the little boy yells, and everything you do for the rest of your life, I made you do. And that's the predicament. Once you've started, everything from here on for the rest of your life is part of this journey of awakening. Now, where does it fit in relation to all the other things of your life? Children, for example, jobs, pleasures, pains, death. See, is it an also ran? Is it another one of them? Well, I'll do death on Tuesday and then I'll work on awakening on Wednesday or I do awakening Sunday mornings. That's when we worry about awakening. Unfortunately, it takes it over. One by one, all of those things come under this until finally you are working to awaken. You say, well, what about service to other people? Well, look at how that works. If I want to help you out of your suffering, Say you're hungry. The way I feed you will determine whether the suffering of your belly is, is alleviated or whether I also simultaneously relieve the root suffering of your separateness. Any act between two human beings can be an act which draws the people closer together into unity or it's divisive. It's the same way as I said about this lecture. If I'm identifying as being the lecturer, you must be the audience. If I'm standing outside of the lecturing and lecturing, you can stand outside of the audience and audience, and we are meeting here and we're dancing this way. And the action brings us closer together. Now, since I know that and I want to, when I feed somebody, I not only want to feed their belly, I want to feed their spirit. I realize that in order to relieve the suffering of other people, I have to work on myself in order that I am not trapped in my own stuff. So that I end up working on myself as an act of compassion for other people. And then you say, well, can you sit around working on yourself when other people are suffering? It's not an either or proposition. Because as you and I quiet down, to hear what we're doing here on earth, what's the meaning of our incarnation. And we listen to the forms through which we must express, through which we must work, what's been handed to us, what's on our plate. Then we act, and if somebody walks up and they're hungry, that's what's on our plate at that moment. If you have a child that's crying, that's on your plate at that moment. To say, like some woman came up to me once and she said, you know, if it wasn't for the kids, I could really do some heavy spiritual work. Okay. Can you hear what she's caught in? The kids are her spiritual work. She just hasn't figured out how to use it as her vehicle. The game is you take what's on your plate and you use it through which to become free. So in the, if somebody is starving, in the process of feeding them, that is the vehicle you use to work on yourself 
to extricate yourself from being identified with being the feeder. Is that too complex? Or can you hear that one? See, what I saw was that there was no way not to be an actor as long as you're in an incarnation. You can't not do anything. Which thing are you not going to do first? You know, I'm just going to sit in bed. Well, that's doing something. See? You can't not do anything as long as you're in a form. Forms do things. And then the question is, which form will you do? Which action will you do? Now, when you fully understand that your incarnation is a vehicle for liberation, and that's what your business is on earth, as pure and simple as that, and as uncompromising as that, then the answer to which one should I do comes out of a place where it doesn't matter. Because it doesn't matter other, out of any other reason. It, it doesn't matter so much that you can be quiet to listen. The statement is, truth waits. This is from the Tao Te Ching. Truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. That it is only when there is quietness inside you that you can listen to hear what part you play, what your unique role is in the game. And no role is better than any other role. Whatever you're doing in your life is no better or worse than what I'm doing in my life. It's just different. And each of us has a unique route through. And the art isn't to imitate somebody else's route, but to listen to hear our own route. Because it is in your fulfilling your form perfectly that you're free. When you push away part of yourself or grab something, you're not free. You're trapped by it. You're trapped by your own grabbing. It's like the monkey that sticks his hand in the jar to get the apple and closes his fist, and then with his fist around the apple, he can't get his hand out of the jar. And he doesn't know what to do because he can't let go of the apple. And it's the way they trap monkeys because they tie the jar to a string. And then he sticks his hand in it. He's not smart enough to let go of the apple to get his hand out, the banana. No way we can fall off the path. You can scare yourself. Oh, I've fallen off the path. But that's just more stuff. And I listen from morning till night to people caught in stuff. And my job is to help them see through the stuff and help them find the place behind the stuff so they can be quiet to hear how to play it out how to honor it properly, how to appreciate. These are words that are very important, words like appreciate. Look at the difference between judge and appreciate. Judging is an intellectual function. Judging is something where you've got to decide between this and that, and you're constantly judging. Isn't it interesting? You go out into the woods and you look at trees, and you appreciate trees, little gnarled trees and big tall trees and oaks and pine and elms. Each one has its own distinctive beauty and little gnarled trees have their own beauty. Everything's quite beautiful. Then you look at humans. Do you notice what happens to appreciation? It turns into judgment. As if, is short better than tall? Is fat better than thin? Is that, 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 all those dimensions. Suddenly it's all judging. And it's interesting to flip judging back into appreciation again. Like in our interaction with hu fellow human beings. We are constantly judging. But when you look at yourself, look at how you have unfolded. It wasn't necessarily all intentional. It's just been an unfolding process. You are what you are. You are an essence statement. If your name is David, you are an essence David at this moment. If you're Doris, you're an essence Doris. You are an essence person in the sense that it is uniquely unfolding quite beautifully. If you set aside judgment and just look at appreciation. Now look at another person. They are unfolding the way they are. Your judgment about them is cutting you off from them. But the appreciation... Like somebody, you have a hard time with somebody. They're a really a real stinker. 
An essence rat. <laughs> now, do you appreciate essence ratness? I mean, they have to live inside of it. <clears throat> so you begin to see that people aren't really doing it to each other so much. You are using other people to do it to yourself. Other people are just being who they are. There's the rat, there's the seeker, there's the somebody wants something, there's somebody giving something, there's somebody powerful, there's somebody... And you use them mercilessly to play out your own model of yourself. And part of this process of awakening is to watch how you do this and start to accept the responsibility for the way in which you use the universe to keep doing it to yourself over and over and over again. And for that, you have to be very quiet to hear how you work. And part of what meditation is about is the technique to quiet you down so that you can begin to watch your own mind at work. And you can watch the way in which you create the stuff of the solidity of the reality of the world you live in. So one of the stances is the stance of listening, of just listening, listening very carefully, listening to hear what is the fullness of this moment. Listening not just with your ears, and not listening just with your intellect, but listening with your whole being as a listening agent, listening intuitively. There is so much more information that comes into us than we process because we reduce the way we process material so well. Two people meet and they get involved and they fall in love and they get married and then later they say, I didn't know about him. <laughs> oh, why didn't you? It didn't have to be concept. The vibration was all there. All of the information. Everybody is a redundant mass of information. If you're quiet enough to hear, you would hear it all. You would know everything intuitively, not conceptually. You wouldn't know you know, but you would know. And if you were trusting the knowing, not the knowing you know, if you didn't need to know you knew, but you just needed to know, you would be able to act in a way that would keep you from being surprised all the time. Is that too much or still too much? Didn't get it? Put it another way, we have closed down that intuitive heart way of knowing the universe and substituted for it the intellectual way of knowing the universe, a conceptual analytic structure. So we think about everything to know whether we know it or not. And if we know each other through our minds, and through our needs, and through our personality, through our ego structures, we are always separate from each other. We are always like objects to each other. And the heart is never fed. There is a way, let me talk about the heart. I'm not talking about the boom, 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 boom. boom. I'm not talking about the anatomical heart. I am not talking about the romantic heart, the do you love me. I am talking about what in Chinese is called the sin sin or it's called the atma or the jivatma in Sanskrit. It is called also the intuitive heart. It is the, the place in you. When I took those drugs and went behind all the places I thought I was and I found a place where I am, that's the doorway to that place. That, in that place, there is a word that I used at the beginning, namaste. Namaste is a, a very common word used in India. It means I honor the place in you where when you're in yours and I'm in mine, there's only one of us. 
Because when you go deep enough into you and get behind all your, all your personality and all your stuff, all your separateness, and I go back it far enough inside me, it ends up there's only one of it. You could call it awareness. You can call it any number of things. You can call it energy. You can, lots of words for it. Part of what we're talking about is how to acknowledge that place in yourself. And then the next part of it is how do you feed it? It's the care and feeding of the intuitive heart. I mean, you must see when you walk down the street and you see somebody that is panhandling or sleeping in a doorway, the way in which you close your heart to deal with that situation most often leaves you tight. It leaves you closed down. It leaves you cut off. It leaves you alienated from the universe around you. And there's an anger in you that that situation demanded that you do that. And you feel safe when you're in your home and you can close the door and you feel safe to open your heart. Isn't that an interesting one? See, the root of that question is, how do we deal with suffering? How do you deal with suffering? Well, how do you deal with your own suffering? You see that you don't have any trouble dealing with, with happiness, with pleasure, which is different than happiness. But pain and suffering, what you try to do is push them away. But you get to the place where you understand that you want to be liberated more than you want to just avoid suffering. And liberation means that you start to use your suffering in order to awaken. And that is a big leap. That is a very big leap. As Gurdjieff says, uh, Gurdjieff was a Russian philosopher. Another thing that people must sacrifice is their suffering. What an interesting word. No one who has not sacrificed his suffering can do this work. Nothing can be attained without suffering. But at the same time, one must begin by sacrificing suffering. What does it mean to sacrifice suffering? It means to stop identifying with it, stop milking it. I don't ask for suffering, but when it comes down the path and I've got it, I work with it. At the extreme end is the monk who says, God, God, give me more pain. It's the hair shirt. It's the one that suffering is seen as grace. My guru used to say, do you like suffering or do you like joy? And people would say, well, I like joy. He'd say, I love suffering. It brings me so close to God. Because when you see what suffering is, it's loss of control. Suffering is forcing you to confront a place in your mind where you're clinging. Like you have a state of non-pain and then there's pain and suddenly you are clinging to the memory of non-pain so the pain is painful. All it is is a strong stimulus. There are great saints who were dying of incredible cancer and ulcers and so on and they had no, nothing to take away the pain and doesn't it hurt? Yeah, well, do you want it to stop? No. It doesn't matter, it's just, just strong stimulation. There are ways of taking suffering and flipping them, and you work with them. Now, you don't lay that on another person. I mean, the example I usually use is somebody comes to me and they say, I want to study yoga with you, and I used to teach yoga, hatha yoga. Okay, I say, well, why don't you fast to purify? Fine, fast for seven days. Fast for nine days. Well, um, I hadn't thought of starting that rigorously. No, fast for nine days, just drink warm water. I mean, you tell people anything, it's okay. Person comes in after seven days, I haven't eaten in seven days. See? And you give them a little ego boost, you know, you're good, you're doing fine. Two more days, you'll be enlightened. See? Then you walk out on the street and somebody walks up to you and says, hey man, you got a quarter. I haven't eaten in seven days. Good, you're doing fine. Two more days and you'll be enlightened. See? Can you see how inappropriate that is? In the first case, the person is saying, let me use this as a vehicle for me to get more conscious. And in the second place, the person saying, let me get rid of this. 
And your job isn't to make a moral judgment about it. Your job is to help people get free of suffering. And you'll find yourself in the paradoxical situation that there'll be a suffering that you're using to get free through and somebody else is asking you to get rid of that suffering and you're helping them to get rid of it. Isn't that interesting? It happens to me all the time. Somebody comes up and says, my marriage is falling apart. I feel like saying, aren't you lucky? What incredible grace. You can work with this so well. A beloved just died. Wow. Whew. I've got AIDS. Oh. Guy came up to me the other day and he said he had AIDS. And he was a, a doctor in Los Angeles. He had just uh, increased his practice twice fold, brought in assistance. He had a new house. He had just given a down payment on. He had two sports cars. He was making it in L.A. And he found out that he had, he started to have AIDS symptoms. He didn't just, wasn't positive. He had AIDS symptoms. And he came in and he was in terror. It's an actual terror. Now, what's happening inside me? There's two levels of this. One is that my human heart my human heart is being ripped apart by his pain and his terror because I can empathize with his predicament. He has a whole model of his life going this way and suddenly, boom, it's all different. And there's fear and confusion and everything. So my human heart is crying. There's the other part of me that is just quietly sitting inside that says, ah, so, new curriculum, advanced course, incredible chance to awaken now. Now, I start to be with him. The first thing he feels is that my human heart is there. He feels like there's a fellow being hurting. And as I said before, the more you're rooted in the emptiness the more your human heart is available. Because when you're not rooted in the, that spiritual depth, that rock-like place, you are afraid of your human emotions for fear they'll sweep you away all the time. It's only when you've got this other balance that you can let yourself in that deeply to those emotions. Because most people, see, most people are either First, they've spent their life being just torn by their emotions. I love it. I hate it. Ooh, ah, ooh. It's all like this all the time. And then they awaken and they get outside of it all. And they're so beyond it all. And somebody falls down in front of them and they say, karma. <laughs> I mean, they're just so remote from it all. You lost either way. You and I have this incredible tension that exists that we are both, if you want to call it whatever words you want to use, we're both human and divine. We are both separate entities with human hearts and we, are both, we also are awareness that is beyond all the drama of it all. And to deny one is to miss the boat. You've got to have both of them. You can't stand anywhere. And so that at the same moment, there is the human heart and if you just go up, the person doesn't feel your humanness. They feel you're intellectually very astute and you're very wise, but you're not warm. And if you're down here, you'll burn out so fast. You will burn out so fast because there is so much suffering in the world. You can't look in a doorway. You can't read the, look at the newspaper. What you had to do, which is what most doctors and nurses and people like that do, is you close down your heart and you use your mind in the service of your heart and you do what's called being professionally warm, which is you act emotional, but you protect your heart because you're afraid it will be destroyed and you've got to save something for home, you think. So you make your patients and all them instead of us. And you end up living with nine-tenths of the world them because nine-tenths of the world are really suffering more than, more than you are. And you're frightened of the stream, the ocean of suffering all around you. And so you're always locking the door and closing and protecting because you feel your heart will break. If you are only identified with your human emotional heart, 
you have no choice but to defend because the suffering is so great. And how much can you do? You're busy helping there and there's that one. And then you're there and it's that one. It's like the dam keeps leaking everywhere you look. But now you cultivate this other part of you behind it, which is just looking and says, ah, so, yes. And you see there is suffering. And you see that the suffering is going to go on and on and that it is an inherent component of incarnation. It isn't even, it isn't even something wrong from the highest place. It just is. It's the nature of form that form has inherent within its suffering because it's a clingy stuff. It clings to it. There's an inertia in form. It's not like liquid. It's not changing all the time. It's, it's sticky. And you begin to see there is a sea of suffering around and you listen quietly to hear your part to play and you play your part. And whether or not the suffering ends is determined by so many factors. It's not in your hands. That's why burnout occurs when doctors think they can take away your suffering. Or a friend thinks they can take away your pain. I don't assume I can take away anybody's anything. I can just be what I am as an environment, and then the other person, whatever they do, they do. And if they're ready to let go of their suffering, they'll let go of it. And if they're not, blessings, my dear. This is, what, this is the wisdom that is expounded in the Bhagavad Gita. And the simple instruction is, be not attached to the fruits of your actions. You do what you can and you do it as impeccably as you can. And what happens is what happens. Because it's determined by much more than you. I may try to make you feel good because I see that you got a sour look on your face, but you also ate a piece of bad cheese last night. You know? And that's a factor beyond my control. Furthermore, from your soul's point of view, I don't even know what function that suffering is serving you. How presumptuous of me to want to take it away from you. And yet my human heart wants to take away your suffering. A couple of years ago, my stepmother died. And I really loved her a great deal. And I was nursing her at the last part of her life. And we got incredibly close. I would lie in the bed and just hold her in my arms. And I would have done anything to take away her pain because I really loved her in, a, in an attached personality way. And I was making milkshakes and holding and watching the pills and doing everything and making sure her bed was just right and carrying it to the toilet every few minutes. And I felt myself just pulled fully into the service to service of that pain, really. And she said to me at one point, Rich, I don't understand the suffering. Like she's in effect saying, I've been a good person all my life. Why am I going through this suffering? And I saw it was like seeing horrible beauty before you. It's horrible beauty. There are a lot of things that you've experienced that are like horrible beauty. Because I watched that her ego couldn't understand the suffering but the suffering and the pain were slowly beating down her ego. And because she had a tough ego, she was a strong-willed person. She knew who she was. She was somebody. And by the last few weeks, I watched that ego start to crumble. The pain forced her surrender. And as that ego surrendered, I began to be aware of a being of such radiance. I had never met this person before. It was like Phyllisness fell away. It was like an egg that was cracked and this new thing came out of it. And by the time she died, I felt like I was in the presence of just living spirit. In fact, she was so far out at the time of her death that she said to me, the last thing she said to me was, Rich, sit me up. And I put her legs over the bed and I sat her up and her body kept falling forward. So I put my hand against her heart and the other hand against the back, her back, and her head kept falling over. So I put my head against her head. And we just, she was straight up. 
And she took three breaths and she left. Isn't it interesting that in Tibetan Buddhism, the way a conscious monk leaves their body is they sit up straight and they take three breaths and they leave. How did she know that? I mean, she went from Dorchester to Brookline to, you know, to Cohasset, for God's sake. <laughs> she didn't go by way of Tibet. She never read any of those books. She didn't know any of that stuff. Could it be that who that being was when she finished being who she thought she was knew that? Could it be that when you let go who you think you are, you begin to recognize who you are and why you are being who you think you are this life? And through that whole period, I was doing my best to take away her suffering. And yet, with that other part of my mind that I was, in which I was seeing as God sees a little bit, I was appreciating the incredible grace of what was happening. And it was awful beauty, horrible beauty. Can you hear that? Like once I was teaching in California, uh, and I had, people gave me a ranch to live at, and it came with a cat. And so I was taking care of the cat, and we got very close, and because I'm really a cat man. And um, in the morning, I'd meditate before my puja table. And the cat got very fond of me, so the cat would go out in the morning and get its morning kill. And it would bring it in and settle between my legs to eat it. <laughs> so I would be meditating, and I'd hear squeak, squeak of a lizard and the tail flopping and this cat playing with it and slowly crunching the skull and so on. And I didn't know who to hate. <laughs> See? See, that's horrible beauty. That's exactly what horrible beauty is. You both hate it and you love it and you understand it and you understand nature is just doing its thing and that's all. And that was the lizard's karma. They say, oh, that's rationalization. That's bullshit, you know. No, it was the lizard's karma. I mean, then it's finished with this lizardness for that moment. See, it's extraordinary to stand back far enough to consider the possibility. I'll just present it. I mean, you will not want it, but I'll present it. That there are no errors in the game. There's a... Great quote. Give me a minute. Plato. To know God is to know the laws, and to feel the goodness of the laws is to praise God. It's difficult for a person to feel the goodness of the laws when the person is suffering. And a person cannot see the goodness of the laws if his or her mind is drugged by the love of pleasure and the fear of pain. Such a mind invents gods or denies them, but never sees the laws at all. Truth waits for eyes unclouded by longing. That when your mind has pulled back, so you are not busy being this or that, or wanting this or averting that, or thinking and identifying with your thoughts, but when you are just aware, you begin to see the nature of the lawful nature of the universe in which all forms are related to all other forms lawfully, and it is just stuff that is unfolding, including you, including your body, and including your thinking mind. It is all law. This podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening, and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.